Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Black History Month. Happy Black History Month to all of you. Um, I'm pretty sure we're all excited about today's event where we're getting started with African American genealogy. This is our virtual workshop, first annual. Hopefully, we can do this again uh, with the lovely Andre Kearns, who is our genealogist for today. A little bit about the city of South Fulton. For those of you that are not residents, maybe you want to be in the future, thinking about it. Uh, we're a wonderful city. We're actually a, Georgia's newest city. Um, we were incorporated May 1st of 2017. We are the fifth largest city in the state of Georgia with over 107,000 residents. We have the best of all worlds. We have cityscapes on our bustling city drives on Old National. We have royal scenic drives in our District 4 areas. And then we also have our suburban living for our growing families here. So we have it all. And with that, um, I am Taryn Love, the communication specialist. And my specialty at the city of South Fulton is community relations and engagement. So planning events just like this so that we're getting involved with our residents, informing them, and bringing them great and fun um, programming that they can use for their family. So that's what we have today. And that'll lead me into introducing our wonderful speaker this, this morning, which is Andre Kearns. He's a genealogist, public speaker, commentator, and writer with deep roots in the American South and a passion for discovering new ancestors and sharing their stories forward. He has extensively researched his family tree, tracing back to 1619 and the first Africans to arrive in Virginia. Through his research, he has discovered that he descends from enslaved persons, slave owners, and free people of color. He serves on the board of the National Genealogical Society and serves as chair of the NGS Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. He is a charter member of the Society of First African Families in English America. He holds a BA in Business Administration from Morehouse College and an MBA from Harvard Business School. He regularly blogs on race, culture, history, and genealogy on his website, median.com backslash Andre Kearns, which I will put in the chat. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Andre Kearns. Karen, thank you so much for that uh, generous introduction and for the invitation to share this talk with all of you in celebration of Black History Month. Um, a uh, little bit more about me, I'm a native of Washington, DC. Uh, yes, I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. When I was at Morehouse, uh, the city of South Fulton did not exist. Um, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm a proud Morehouse graduate. I have my colors on this morning. Um, I'm married, I have two sons. Uh, I've been researching my family history for about 15 years. As I mentioned in the chat, um, I've traced my family back to uh, uh, Virginia and also North Carolina. And I just really have a passion for researching and then sharing um, my research through blogs and presentations like this. Uh, and so really just happy to be here uh, with you today. All right. So let's, let's jump into it. So here are the topics that I'm gonna cover this morning in this session. First, I'm gonna talk a little bit about celebrating Black History Month. Uh, and then I'm gonna give you a Black History Month pop quiz. I know you didn't expect this. This is a Saturday and we're not supposed to be uh, in school, but uh, we're gonna start with a pop quiz. So hopefully get, it, get you engaged. Um, and then I'll share my approach as a genealogist to uncover family history. And then I'll apply my approach to uncover Black family history within my own family. I'll then apply my approach to trace back to uh, my African ancestry. And then I'll um, close with some, some final thoughts. All right, celebrating Black History Month. So Black History Month was first actually celebrated in February of 1925 or 1926 rather, as Negro History Week. And it was founded by historian Carter G. Woodson. Uh, and he founded it to commemorate and celebrate the contributions of African Americans. I think it's been since 1976 that we've known this as Black History Month. And so again, during Black History Month, 
We celebrate famous black figures like uh, Madam C.J. Walker, who is um, depicted here, who was one of the first female self-made millionaires in America. And she really made her fortune developing and selling hair care products for black women. And in the process, she created an industry that now is uh, worth over $700 million annually. And uh, we know of the, the Bronner um, hair care uh, week that happens in Atlanta. I think that's well representative of the massive industry that Madam CJ Walker helped to create. Now I wanna um, transition into my family. So Madam CJ Walker and my great grandmother. So through my family research, I actually was able to discover a family connection to Madam CJ Walker through my great grandmother and her name was Georgia Joyner. So what you're looking at on the left here is a 1917 contract for my great grandmother, Georgia Joyner, to become a sales agent for Madam C.J. Walker and her hair care products uh, uh, in Suffolk, Virginia. And so uh, it was just amazing to, for me to uh, discover this document that had been passed down in our family and that my great grandmother was associated with and affiliated with Madam C.J. Walker and her movement to sell these black hair care products to black women at that time. And so here's a photo of my great grandmother, Georgia Sharp Joyner of Suffolk, Virginia. And Suffolk, Virginia is in the Tidewater region of Virginia. But I really just love this photo of her. It just, you know, it shows her intensity and um, that she just didn't play around. She was all about business. But she was, a, uh, she was a, a grocery store owner in Suffolk, Virginia, and she was a very savvy entrepreneur. And so here's an article uh, that was printed, or uh, rather a notice that was printed in the Suffolk News Herald um, in 1958, announcing that the Suffolk Business and Professional Women's League would be meeting at my great grandmother, Georgia Joyner's house. So this is just a demonstration that she was an established business leader within her own community. And I also wanted to point out that she's also a champion of education in her community of Suffolk. She was responsible for establishing the Nansman Collegiate Institute. So before Suffolk was Suffolk, it was called Nansman County. And so she was responsible for establishing the Nansman Collegiate Institute, which is where my grandmother was educated. So you see that marker on the historical marker on the left for Nansman uh, Collegiate Institute. And then um, my great grandmother was also responsible for establishing East Suffolk High School, where my, and then you see that photo on the right of her with other founders of East Suffolk High School. And so East Suffolk High School was where my mother was educated. So my grandmother went on from Nansman Collegiate Institute to um, attend college at uh, Virginia State University. Back then it was known as Virginia College for Negroes. And then my mother who graduated from East Suffolk High School went on to integrate Randolph-Macon Women's College in Lynchburg, Virginia, which is now known as uh, Randolph College. So I guess I wanted to start with this because I just wanted to show there's so much Black history in our own family trees, and it's just there waiting to be found. So hopefully through the process of this presentation, I'll be able to equip you with some tools that you can use and apply to your own uh, family search to uncover uh, Black family history in your family tree. All right, so now it is time for our Black History Month pop quiz. And so I have four questions and I'll ask you to respond 
to each of them via the Zoom poll. So hopefully you can see that Zoom poll that Taryn has uh, hosted. So here's our first question. When did the first Africans arrive in English colonial North America? So pick one choice and then uh, I'll give you uh, a few seconds to pick your selection and then we'll show the results and I'll reveal the answer. Okay, and Andrea, I'm not sure if we see, if everybody could just put in the chat, are you seeing one question or are you seeing all of the questions? Um, and then we can do a little timer, but I think- I'm seeing all of them. Okay, yeah, I'm seeing all of them too. All right, so I'll walk through all oh, of no. them and I'll walk through all of them and then you guys can, um, can then say. you can okay. answer. So, so poll question number two, when was slavery legalized, legally recognized in Virginia? That's question number two. Question number three, in what year do newly emancipated people in America first uh, appear by name in the census? And then question number four, how many fifth great grandparents do you have? Okay, it seems like some people are having issues with seeing the questions. So it should be, if you're on your phone or tablet, you should be able to uh, swipe your screen all the way over um, in order to kind of see the pop-up if you're not on a computer. Um, and right now we have it up for two minutes. So we have 17 out of 55 participants. So we'll let it go for another minute for those of you that are having issues and then we'll end it and see what the correct responses are. I feel like we need something. Like, doo, 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 doo. That's right. Yeah, we need <laughs> right. our we need our Jeopardy uh, music playing. Right, going. Okay, so we got thirty out of fifty-five. So if you're trying to jump in, you got thirty more seconds to answer the questions. Awesome, Ursula. She said she had to click next at the bottom. Okay, cool. Okay, so we are about to end the poll. So get your answers in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All righty. So we're going to share the results. Can you see the results um, on your screen, Andre? Yes. Okay. So you can, do you want to say the correct answer or do you want me to show the correct answer? Yeah, I'll, I'll say it. So I, okay. it's actually showing. So um, for okay. question number one, when did the first Africans arrive in English colonial North America? The correct answer is 1619. And 68% um, of you got that correct. Um, and uh, I think the, uh, you know, we recently celebrated, uh, or not, I wouldn't say celebrate, I would say commemorated 1619 and uh, 400 years of uh, Africans being in um, America. Um, and there's also the very visible 1619 project. So that's probably what drove a lot of our awareness of this date. Um, so so um, good job on that. And by the way, in 1619, the first Africans arrived in Point Comfort, Virginia, which is um, known as Hampton, Virginia today. So that's question number one. Ooh, question number two, when was slavery legally recognized in Virginia? So we've got more of a, a, a good distribution here. 29% of you said 1619, 24% um, said 1640, 26% said 1661, and then 21% said 1717, 1770. So the answer is actually 1661. And it, um, it was the Fugitive Slave Law. And so the Fugitive Slave Law responded to this problem that was happening, this emerging problem in the Virginia um, colony where European indentured servants were running away with African enslaved persons. And so what this law defined was if they were caught, 
the European servant would get additional time added to his or her service as punishment. And they would have to serve the time for the enslaved African as well, because the enslaved African was enslaved for life. And so there's no tacking on additional time. So they would tack that on to the time of the European um, indigenous servant. Um, question three, in what year do newly emancipated people first appear by name in the census? Um, this is good. Most of you got this correct, 1870. So uh, slavery officially or formally ended with the um, end of the Civil War, with the Union winning the Civil War. And so you have emancipation, true emancipation in 1865. Uh, the census uh, it happens every year, um, every 10 years. Uh, and so 1870 was the first census where emanc newly emancipated people were um, listed by name. And note that um, enslaved persons did show up in prior census records, but as, as a count, not, uh, not by name. All right. Uh, and then question number four, how many fifth great grandparents do we have? Um, so the answer is B, 128. So, and you will meet one of mine uh, over the course of this presentation. So thanks everybody for participating in that pop quiz. <laughs> Hopefully it gets the juices flowing and uh, it was a little bit of fun. All right, so we can, uh, we can um, get rid of the poll and we'll keep going. All right, so my approach to genealogy. Um, here's my approach to genealogy and it really has four steps. The first step is you need to create your family tree. The second step is that you need to talk with your family uh, to understand your family history um, as best as you can. Step three is to then extend your understanding of your family history through traditional genealogical records research. Then step four is to discover uh, with DNA testing, okay? So these are the four steps that I take. And what I would say is that all of these strategies are gonna help you to stay organized and stay focused and stay really systematic as you work to advance your family history. So now what I wanna do is just go into a little bit uh, of additional detail on each of these steps. So step one, creating a family tree. Um, my guidance would be to start documenting what you know first and then work your way back. So document yourself, your spouse, your children, your parents, your grandparents, uh, and work your way back. Um, and so there are three ways that you can document your family tree. The first is the old fashioned way with pen and paper. And so you can find a family tree chart, print that out and start to add names to that. Uh, a second method would be to consider family tree software. So I use a, a software package called Family Tree Maker where I keep my family tree. So, um, so that's another option. And then the third option would be to consider online family trees, uh, such as um, Ancestry.com uh, or MyHeritage or uh, FamilySearch. And by the way, FamilySearch is a free service. And so I use um, Ancestry.com and you can actually, you actually can create a, a tree for free on Ancestry. But then if you wanna be able to access all the records and things that Ancestry makes available, you will need a, a paid subscription to Ancestry.com and it costs about $100 a year. So that's something you'll wanna consider. All right, so that's step one. Step two, talk with your family. Oral family history plays a vital role in African-American genealogical research. So I would encourage you to interview your family members, your family elders, um, 
collect family photos, uh, review documents that have been passed down in your family. So the person in the photo here is, is my grandfather. His name's James Richards. Um, he's from Suffolk, Virginia, and he's my maternal grandfather. So he's my mother's father. Uh, a little bit about him and his uh, Black history. He's a World War II vet. So he landed uh, in Normandy. Um, he, uh, he was a Howard University trained pharmacist. Um, and he owned and operated the only black pharmacy in Suffolk, Virginia, in his hometown. And he loved to talk. He was an extrovert and he was a great source of uh, history and of family stories. And so uh, when you find uh, uh, your family members who can provide you that history, talk with them, gather names of ancestors, what were their birth names, what were their uh, maiden names for, for your female ancestors, what were their nicknames, uh, when were, what were the dates in which they were born, when they died, when they were married, where were they born, where did they live their lives, where did they die? And, um, you know, another key piece of information would be asking for uh, the names of the uh, enslavers of your family, right? So, for example, in my family, uh, on my mother's side, it was passed down that uh, our family was from Bertie County, North Carolina, and that we, uh, our family uh, had been owned by a slave owner named Cater Biggs. And so, um, you know, clues like that are very important to gather because then they will guide your research. They'll help you form a hypothesis that will help you to uh, guide your research um, as you try to uncover your family story. So anyway, gather all these family stories that make up the Black history in your family. And remember, family stories, while they may not always be 100% accurate, they almost always contain nuggets of truth invaluable clues that are going to help you to advance your research, okay? So that's step two, talk with your family. Um, step three, extend uh, your uh, family research with traditional genealogical research, okay? And so a key challenge for African-American researchers is in particular is limited available documentation due to slavery. Uh, but with that said, here's a short list of records that I have found very useful in uh, extending um, my research of my African-American family. The first record I'll cover census records, which I've mentioned earlier in, in our poll. Um, the census records, uh, the census was, was recorded every 10 years, starting in 1790. Uh, it records the family unit. Um, what I would say is maybe start with the 1940 census, which is the most recent census that's available online, and work your way back. And then note that uh, a couple notes that number one, 1870 census, as we said from the quiz, is the first census in which formerly enslaved people are named. And then also note the 1890 census is unfortunately missing. Uh, it was burned in a, in a massive fire. So unfortunately that will be just uh, a blocker that you'll have to somehow move past. So I wanna give you that, um, that heads up. Marriage records. Uh, so from there you can gather the name, the full name of the groom, the full name of the bride, including their maiden name and then their self-reported parents. So um, that's important. Um, death records will list your birth and death date for your ancestors their parents' names, make sure you compare those to the marriage records uh, for consistency, and then also the often will list the locations of your, uh, uh, where your parent, where their parents were born. Um, probate records, so probate records uh, record the distribution of an estate after uh, a person dies. And so uh, in particular, if you had enslaved ancestors and you may, you think you know the name, of your enslavers, um, you can check probate records to see, look for the names of enslaved persons who might've been uh, your ancestors that are distributed as part of the uh, enslavers uh, estate. 
and then deeds record. So bill of bills of sale um, can list names of enslaved persons. So again, check deeds records of enslavers who uh, may have enslaved your ancestors and look for the name transactions that include the names of your potential ancestors. And as you're doing, so that's step three, and there's another part of this step three of, the, of, of researching uh, genealogical records. What I would say is when you're researching these genealogical records, you need to bring a critical mind to your research, right? So always try to examine and the original document or an image of the original document that you're that you're looking at um, and expect to encounter a lot of inconsistencies in the names, in the dates, et cetera, um, that you're going to find on your ancestors, particularly for formerly enslaved ancestors. I know we live in a time where we are very used to and expect a high level of precision in terms of information about that we know about ourselves and our ancestors. We know exactly how our names are spelled. We are a letter, literate society. We know the exact day and year that we were born. We may know the hour we were born. It was a very different situation for our um, formerly enslaved ancestors. Uh, it wasn't that exact. Um, so look for clues and patterns when you're looking through this doc these documents. Take a step back and ask what is likely through the inconsistency. So here's an example. Um, see the variability in all the records that I have uncovered on my great-great-grandfather, Edward William Biggs. So his name and his birth date, as you can see, vary across all these, these documents I've uncovered on his life sometimes considerably. Uh, so let's take birth date. The birth date varies a lot for, uh, for um, Edward William Biggs. So some documents list his birth date as early as 1867. Others list his birth date as late as 1875. Um, the way that his name is listed is also inconsistent. So you see at the top of the chart, his 1951 death certificate, uh, states that his name is Edward Biggs. Then in the 1940 census, he's listed as E.W. Biggs. Then in the 1930 census, he's listed as William E. Biggs. And then in the 1880 census, he's listed as William E. Peel. And so it turns out his mother had married a man named Thomas Peel a few years prior. And that's why he's listed as a Peel in that census, but his, his last name really is Biggs. So just be aware of these inconsistencies you're gonna be, you're gonna uncover and make sure you're researching with a critical mind. Step four, DNA testing. So what is genealogical DNA testing? Um, so what I'd say is that um, DNA testing estimates your ethnic mixture and helps you to discover and verify ancestral relationships and help uncover ancient ancestral roots. Um, and so what are the different types of DNA tests that you can take to help advance your family history? Um, the first is called autosomal DNA testing. And so with your autosomal DNA test results, uh, you'll get a summary of your entire ethnic makeup and so if you look on the left side of this chart, you, you see my ethnic makeup chart from Ancestry DNA, a summary of it. Um, uh, so, so there's uh, autosomal DNA testing. Next is um, uh, mtDNA testing or, or mitochondrial DNA testing. And this tests your direct maternal ancestry. So your mother's 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 mother going back hundreds and hundreds of years. So that's the second test type that I wanna highlight, DNA test type I wanna highlight. Then the third uh, type I wanna highlight is called Y-DNA testing. And the Y-DNA testing helps to test your direct paternal ancestry. And so because this testing is, a, um, is, uh, is 
uh, possible because they're testing the Y chromosome. Only men can take this Y DNA test. Uh, and so uh, again, this allows you to trace your ancestry back to your father's 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 father, all the way back hundreds and hundreds of years. So what I would so these are the main uh, DNA test types. And what I would say is that understanding what each of these DNA test types provides you should really be what informs which DNA test you might be interested in taking, right? Uh, and so what I'll also say is with most of these tests, all of them actually, you get um, DNA matches back. And so the DNA matches in your results, what I would, what I found is they are the most valuable part of your results in terms of advancing your research. So a little bit more on um, uh, DNA testing. Here's a listing of the top DNA services that are available uh, for you all to, to utilize. There's Ancestry DNA, there's 23andMe, there's My Heritage, there's Family Tree DNA, and then there's a service called GEDmatch, which um, means that um, if you take a, a DNA test with any of those other services and you get the results, you can actually upload your results to GEDmatch and source more, um, more matches. So I've actually tested with all of these services. They've all been helpful to me in my uh, advancing my family research. Um, normally people, the first thing people ask me is which test should I take, right? So if I had to, without any information on what a person's trying to achieve, advise them on which um, DNA test to take, I usually recommend Ancestry. And that's just because they've tested the most people. So it gives you the highest likelihood of generating more matches, right? And so you see Ancestry on this chart is the green line. But I think the reality is that each of these services has its own pros and cons. And so anyone considering DNA testing, uh, you, you know, you're gonna benefit from uh, just doing a little bit of research to figure out which service you're most interested in moving forward on. Um, and then here are the steps to DNA testing. Uh, first, you know, you choose your test service, which I just talked about, um, based on what you want to achieve. And then um, you purchase a kit. So all of these testing services make their kits available for purchase online. Uh, and so once you purchase your kit, you'll get uh, the kit delivered to you in the mail. When you open the kit up, it's going to walk you through and give you instructions to walk you through how to provide a saliva sample. Um, and so follow those instructions to provide the saliva sample and then seal up your um, sample and mail it back into the test company. And then check for uh, your results online. And what I found is that uh, the results typically take four to six weeks to process. So just keep that in mind. So let's say you've picked a uh, service and you've, uh, you've tested and you've gotten your results back. You've logged in and you're looking at your results. So now let's talk about those results. So here, is, um, my, my, uh, here are my ethnicity results from Ancestry DNA. So Ancestry DNA actually offers a feature uh, that visualizes your ancestry on a map. So that's what you're looking at for me here. Uh, and so you see, the Americas highlighted, you see West Africa highlighted, and you see Northern Europe highlighted. Um, so th these are my genealogies, right? These are my, um, this is my ethnic makeup. Uh, and probably what you notice is that my ethnic makeup as a map is the story of the transatlantic slave trade. Europeans sailed to the coast of West Africa and they picked up captives and they uh, shipped them to the Americas. Those same Europeans uh, had offspring um, through forced, coerced um, relations often with enslaved Africans, uh, African women. 
And then you have uh, Native Americans that have offspring with both African Americans and European Americans. And so this is all the history within my DNA. This is likely the history within your DNA. Uh, and so it's just interesting to uncover. Um, so what I'll say here is that, so according to Ancestry DNA, I'm about 65% of African ancestry, about 34% of European ancestry, and about 1% of Native American ancestry. Leveraging uh, DNA results to trace to African ancestry. So I want to zoom in on my African ancestry a little bit more. And so uh, what you see on the left is that same map. Um, that visualized um, all of the places where my African ancestors likely came from, according to my um, ancestry DNA results. So first, take a look at those regions. Now, take a look at the map on the right side of my chart. And um, that's a map of the major African regions contributing to the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, in the 17th and the 18th centuries, uh, according to Dr. Audrey Brown of the National Park Service. So as you can see, when I correlate the map on the left of my genetic ancestry with the one on the right, I'm able to estimate that many of my ancestors were from the slave trading regions of West Central Africa, of Benin, and of the Gold Coast. So I just wanted to point out that lens for which you can start to look at your uh, ethnicity results with your DNA match, uh, DNA uh, test results. DNA result matches. So um, here is a sampling of the DNA matches that uh, I generated on Ancestry DNA. And I literally have thousands and thousands of them. And so, as I said before, the most valuable part of your results are the DNA matches that you will generate when you, when you DNA test. And so these are all people who have also tested with the DNA test service, in this case, Ancestry DNA. And these are people with whom you share identical segments of DNA which means you are most likely related to them. And so I have found a lot of success connecting with my various DNA matches who are fourth to six uh, cousins or closer. Um, and then, um, you know, comparing and then reaching out to them, comparing family trees, comparing family research, and then working together to figure out exactly how we are related, right? Um, and figuring out who our common ancestors are. And so I've been able to really expand my family tree quite extensively through just engaging my DNA matches. So if you DNA test, I would encourage you to, to be committed to do this. So now, Let's apply this approach that I just outlined. Step one, create a family tree. Step two, talk with family members. Step three, uh, research through uh, traditional genealogical records research. And step four, uh, DNA test. Let's apply this four-step approach to uncover Black family history within my own family tree. All right, so steps. I'm gonna cover steps one and two with this chart, creating a family tree and extending it through family history. So here is my Kearns and Richards family tree, which I created on ancestry.com. And it's a Kearns family tree because my father is a Kearns and it is a Richards family tree because my mother is a Richards. And I've been building this tree since 2006. And so this is what's called a pedigree view of my family tree. So it sits horizontally. And so you see my kids on the left-hand side, and then you work to me and my wife and my parents, and my grandparents, and my great-grandparents. Uh, and so I've worked this tree back to my great-grandparents, 
Um, and I was able to do most of this just off of family oral history alone. Um, so, but, but so now let's choose my, um, one of my great grandparents, uh, Sarah Ann Biggs, and she's highlighted there in the red box. Let's choose her as the branch that I wanna extend, okay? So that was steps one and two. Now step three, advancing research through traditional genealogical records research. So my great grandmother, um, Sarah Ann Biggs, um, who is known as Annie, uh, was born in Suffolk, Virginia in 1902. And she married my great grandfather, his name was James Richards, at age 16. So she was very young. And she had six children with him um, by the time she was 27 years old, and including my, uh, my grandfather, uh, James Richards. Um, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and so my great grandmother, Annie Biggs Richards died tragically at the age of 28 in 1930. And so you're looking at her death certificate. So she died from tetanus uh, complicated by miscarriage. That's excruciating to read, to, 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 to think about. You know, I think, um, as you're doing your family research, you need to give yourself the space to really process what you're uncovering. And so, you know, I've seen this document hundreds of times and it, it hurts my heart the same way every time I see it. Um, but that's the nature of this research that we're doing. You're gonna discover inspiring things about your family and you're gonna discover very painful and tragic things that happen to your family. Um, but anyway, this death record lists the name of my great grandmother's parents. And so with this death certificate, I'm able to push my ancestry back to my great, great grandparents, Edward Biggs and Florence Combo. And so now let's focus on extending uh, the ancestry of my great, great grandfather, Edward Biggs. And so here is an 1870 census record for a place called Bertie County, North Carolina, which is right over the border uh, of um, Virginia and of Suffolk, Virginia. Um, so Virginia sits on top of North Carolina. So you go from Suffolk over the border and you're in Bertie County, North Carolina. So if you look at the bottom row of this chart, you will see my great great grandfather Edward Biggs. He's listed as Eddie, age three. And on the row above, you see uh, a woman named Sarah Biggs, and that's his mother. Okay. Uh, and so now with this census document, we've pushed my ancestry back to my third great grandmother, Sarah Biggs. And so Sarah is 30 years old in the census record, but this is the first census record in which she appears by name. And that is because she was formerly enslaved, okay? And as we, as we know from the quiz, 1870 census, that's the first census in which formerly enslaved people appear by name. Friedman's Bureau record for my great third great grandmother, Sarah Ann Biggs. So here's a good example of black history that I was able to uncover in my family tree. Here's a Freedmen's Bureau record for my third great grandmother. And so just a little context on the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was established in 1865 after the Civil War by Congress to provide help to all of the newly emancipated African-Americans in the United States as they transitioned from slavery into freedom, as they built their new lives as free people. And so my third great grandmother, Sarah Ann Biggs was born enslaved around 1848 in Bertie County. And then as an adult, post-emancipation, she actually became a teacher in Freedmen's Bureau schools from 1865 to 1870. And so what you're looking at is a check 
from the Freedmen's Bureau that was written to pay for rent for a schoolhouse, uh, for a schoolhouse where she taught. And um, it features an amazing treat for me. If you look on the bottom right-hand corner of this check, it features her signature. And so I don't have a picture of her, but I have a, a, a view of her signature and how she wrote. But as I said, she was born enslaved, but she was clearly able to read and write. And that's what put her in a position to be a Freeman's Beer teacher. And so you might ask, well, then how did she learn to read and write if she was enslaved? Because as we know, enslaved people were, it was, it was illegal to teach enslaved people to read and write. Well, based on my research, I think she was likely able to pursue teaching because she was known as a house slave. So there were field slaves and then there were house slaves. The house slaves worked in the house. Um, they were in closer proximity to the, uh, um, in, their enslavers. And so I'm get so as a house slave, I'm guessing that she actually learned how to read and write. There's more to uncover in that story, um, but anyway, it's just powerful for me to see that my third great grandmother, after she was uh, emancipated, dedicated her life to educating those who were formerly enslaved like herself, so that they could um, forge these new lives uh, that they were leaving. And, uh, you know, I really trace back the value of education in our family back to my third great grandmother, Sarah Ann Biggs, who was a teacher uh, after uh, she was emancipated. Um, I also wanted to provide some context on slavery in North Carolina. So um, geographic barriers made it very difficult to ship enslaved people directly into North Carolina. So most people who were enslaved in North Carolina were victims of the domestic slave trade. Um, so they were either imported from Virginia or from South Carolina. And so note that I've added a dot for the location of Bertie County, North Carolina. So if you look at the top of the state, on the right hand side, that's the red dot. That's Bertie County, North Carolina, where uh, my third great grandmother, Sarah Biggs, was enslaved. And so Virginia sits right on top of North Carolina. So given Bertie County's location, uh, I believe that Sarah's ancestors were likely imported from Virginia into North Carolina. A little bit about slavery in North Carolina. It was driven, like for most Southern states, by the cash crop economy, tobacco, rice, cotton. For North, in North Carolina, the enslaved were about a third of the total population. Most enslaved persons in North Carolina toiled as field laborers, the, uh, field slaves, or as domestic, domestics, house slaves. Uh, and then slave codes further restricted the activities and lives of those enslaved in North Carolina. All right, so let's keep going. So remember, step four in our approach is um, discovering through DNA testing. So DNA testing actually helped me to uncover that my third great grandmother, Sarah Ann Biggs' mother was an enslaved woman named Clara. And so through DNA testing, I pushed my ancestry now back another generation to my fourth great grandmother, Clara. And so what you're looking at is a document, it's a probate record. Remember I mentioned probate records uh, as a valuable record in uh, researching uh, enslaved uh, ancestors. This is a probate record for the slaveholder Godwin Cotton, of Bertie County, North Carolina. And it's dated March 5th, 1844. And Clara, um, my fifth great grandmother was enslaved to Godwin Cotton and his wife, Mariah. And so after Godwin Cotton died in 1844, many of the people enslaved to him were sold off. And among them were my um, fourth, was my fourth great grandmother, Clara. I apologize, I think I called her my fifth 
earlier, but she's really my fourth great grandmother, Clara. And so as you can see in this document, she was purchased by a man named Cater Biggs at Godwin Cotton's estate sale. And the other thing you need to note was that she was purchased for $1. So I'm gonna pause here again. As part of this research, I've discovered so many documents like this that put a numeric value on the selling of my own ancestors uh, in slavery. And so you see, you, I see these documents and every time I discover a new one, I experience kind of the same cycle of feelings. Uh, I feel shocked to see my ancestors listed for dollar values. I feel a deep sadness when I see these things. I feel that sadness turns to anger that this is our history and that they had to go through that. But then eventually my anger turns into inspiration because I'm inspired by the strength of my ancestors and that they endured what they endured so that we could be here. Um, so returning to this particular record, my natural question was, why in the world did the cotton sell Clara to Cater Biggs for $1? So I want you to just consider that question, hold on to it, and let's continue searching. Next, um, I actually found a marriage record for Clara and it listed her mother's name as Winnie. And so now that's extended my ancestry back another generation to my fifth great grandmother, Winnie. And remember our pop quiz, we have 128 fifth great grandparents. And so what you're looking at is a will for um, an enslaver named John Young and it's dated September 5th, 1832 in Bertie County, North Carolina. And so in his will, John Young gives my fifth great grandmother, Winnie, and all of her increases, meaning her children, to his granddaughter named Jane Cotton. And so Jane Cotton would grow up and marry the enslaver Cater Biggs. And so with that, I have uncovered this answer to this $1 question. That's the connection that explains it. Clara, based on this will, was owned by Jane Cotton Biggs, Cater's wife. And so the sale for a nominal amount simply transferred ownership of Clara to Cater Biggs. And so um, as you can see, using that approach, I was able to trace my African descended enslaved ancestors back through three generations of enslavement in Bertie County, North Carolina. So now let's apply this same approach to trace back to my African ancestors. And so let's go back to my uh, great grandmother, Sarah Ann Biggs death certificate. And let's focus on her mother. Previously, we looked at her father, Edward Biggs and his ancestry. Now let's focus on her mother, um, Florence Cumbo, who is my great great grandmother. Now here's a summary of what I've uncovered about my combo ancestors through extensive research. So my combo ancestors were among the first Africans arriving in Virginia prior to 1630. And they arrived to Virginia from the kingdom of Ndongo, which is in modern day Angola. Um, and the name Kumbo is a, is a very unique sounding name. Uh, it caught my attention when I first started to research it. And what I found is it has origins in Africa. Um, my first generation Kumbo ancestor to be born in Virginia became free. 
And so his descendants lived as free people of color, which means that they were um, not white, but they were also not enslaved. And the Kumbos are African, all African descended, uh, but they're also of mixed European and sometimes Native American ancestry. Uh, and so what I found through my research is that over successive generations, many Kumbo family branches maintained uh, a Black uh, identity or they passed into white communities or they embraced full Native American identities. And so because of that, um, Kumbo descendants that you'll uh, find today self-identify across all of these racial groups. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, um, as the Kumbo family grew, so did variations of the name, um, how the name spelled and pronounced. So it, um, it expanded to Kumba, Kumbi, Kumbia, Combo, Cumber, McCumby, and it seems like every week that I research this family, I find another variation to the name. So uh, a little bit on, more on our Cumbel family origins. They start with uh, two Africans, Emmanuel and Joan of Ndongo, modern day Angola. And so Emmanuel and Joan are my 11th great grandparents as I estimated. And they arrived from Africa to Point Comfort, Virginia, which we mentioned in the pop quiz, on slave ships sometimes between, sometime between 1619 and 1628. So um, look at the map on the left-hand side of Virginia um, in, six, uh, in the 1600s. Number, uh, point number one, location number one, that is Point Comfort. That's where they arrived. And so from Point Comfort, they were then bound to landowners at a place called Archer's Hope Creek in James City County, Virginia. And so look at number two, that's uh, the location of James City County and Archer's Hope Creek. So that's where they toiled as laborers on the land. And so I have found land documents from 1638 and 1639 that place my ancestors Emmanuel and Joan in James City and, uh, and they're tied to the land of a man named William Davis. A little bit more on the documents I discovered. Here's a 16, 6, 1651 land document uh, for Joan. And it ties her to her, uh, her son, Emmanuel. It ties them together. So if you look at the what I've um, highlighted in the red box, you see Manuel uh, Negro and Joan Negro. Um, that's mother and son. Um, tied together in this land document. They were working this land. And then the next document I wanted to share is um, Emmanuel Cumbro Negro. So this is my 10th great grandfather. He was born around 1634 to Emmanuel, the African, and Joan, uh, the African, in James City County. And so uh, a little bit on his life in 1644, the Virginia House of Burgess ruled him no slave, but an indentured servant. And so he's ordered to serve 21 years of indentured servitude. And so he, he does that. And by September, 1665, he's free. And so, as I said earlier on the Cumbo family history, from this point on, Emmanuel Cumbo and his Cumbo descendants live as free people of color in America. And so what you're looking at is um, a document. So on 18, the 18th of April, um, 1667, two years after Emmanuel Cumbo achieved his freedom, he takes ownership of 50 acres of land in James City County, where his mother Joan and his father Emmanuel labored for William Davis. And so you are looking at that 1667 land grant and you see I've underlined uh, Emmanuel Cumbo Negro listed there. Um, and so with this document, um, he becomes one of the very few African-American landowners in 1600s 
Virginia, which is phenomenal Black history. Uh, Cumbo family reunion. So here's a photo from our Cumbo family reunion. Uh, and back in, I think it was like 2016, which I helped to organize. And it's just, it's amazing to have the opportunity to meet so many of my um, family members, um, which I uh, connected to through my research and also specifically through DNA testing, which I mentioned previously. And so we hosted this family reunion in Williamsburg, Virginia, just a few miles from Jamestown, where uh, my ancestor, where our ancestor, Emmanuel Cumbo, again, was one of the few African-American landowners in the 1600s. Ooh, and it gets better. So our uh, amazing hostess for this event, uh, Taryn, um, we're cousins. And so uh, um, we are actually cousins through the Cumbo family. And so we actually connected on Facebook a few years ago. I, and um, we started comparing notes and uh, sharing uh, family history and research. And we figured out exactly how we were related. And so actually, uh, we're meeting for the first time on the Zoom. So I, I want to take this opportunity to say uh, to my cousin Taryn, it's a treat to meet you. And thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to, to give this talk. No problem, I'm... it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is, this is fantastic. So um, this is what it's all about. This is just always a new, a new element to the, to the journey and uh, uh, why I enjoy um, uncovering family history and connecting fam with family so much. Um, so just to, to, to summarize, um, I, you know, I provide you, uh, I challenge you to find your inspiration for what, for why you want to research your family tree. And so I shared a little bit about um, my inspiration being wanting to uncover Black history in my own family. And the inspiration that I draw from uncovering the story of my great grandmother, um, Georgia Joyner, and all of the amazing things she did within her own community to make history. Um, so, so find your inspiration. And then once you've done that, I've provided you a roadmap, a four-step approach to uncovering your family history. Uh, um, create a family tree, talk with your family members to uncover your family history, extend your family history through traditional genealogical records research, and then consider DNA testing. And then as you're researching, be sure to dig deeper to really uncover the, the Black history in your family. You know, we're the fruits of our ancestors' strength and perseverance. And I'm really proud to be a product of the amazing uh, Black history in my own family. And I'm energized every day by that. Uh, and I'm energized by the opportunity to really discover our family history and to share it forward. So I wanna thank you. Um, and uh, I wanna, I hope that you found this talk interesting and helpful. And um, I, you know, I wanna close with a photo. This photo is very uh, important to me. Um, I started this presentation um, telling you a little bit about my great grandmother, Georgia Joyner. This is the only photo uh, that we took together. So that's her holding me as a baby. She died a year later. Um, so I want to end with this, but um, thank you all. And with that, I've um, included my um, email address if you want to follow up. Also my blog on Medium if you'd like to uh, see more of my research. And with that, I'll close and I'm happy to um, take any questions that you have. Awesome, Andre. Thank you so much for that presentation. And like you said, guys, this was literally our first time meeting. We've been chatting um, on Facebook for about three to four years now. So um, I knew that Andre was just amazing when it comes to genealogical research. And I thought this would be perfect to bring to the city of South Fulton um, for our community relations event for February for Black History Month. So as you can imagine, Andre, we have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, so I'm gonna read the ones that are in the chat. And if some of you, if time permits, 
um, would like to, to cut your mic on, we'll do that as well. But we'll start in the chat. And um, Ajua says, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, are these 1600 documents things you found online or did you have to go to an archive? Uh, yes, I found them online. So um, the Library of Virginia has uh, digitized um, a lot of those patent records that I included in my um, presentation. And so you can find them there. Additionally, um, there are other resources like um, there's a, a book called um, uh, Virginia uh, Cavaliers and Pioneers that um, publishes all of the a lot of the land patent records that I researched and then I talked about in um, um, in my presentation. Uh, and so, yeah, there's so much information that's available online um, for you to for you to uncover. But I will also say that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's still not digitized and available online. So uh, I have also um, visited the Library of Virginia to to, uh, you know, do research on uh, on microfilm and um, to, to be able to look at the, the documents, um, you know, in person in the library. Sometimes that's the only way that you'll be able to access the document. So, um, you know, I do both, but there is a ton of information that is available uh, at our fingertips online. And so I'd encourage you to explore all of it. Awesome. Crystal Jackson asked, did you use Salt Lake City, Utah archives for any of your research? Yes. So, um, so there's this uh, website called familysearch.org, uh, which is um, run by the Mormon Church. Uh, and the Mormon Church also uh, runs the Salt Lake City uh, archive. And so um, most of what's or a, a lot of what's in the Salt Lake City archive is available online through uh, to you through Family Search for free, uh, and so you need to just um, register with Family Search, and then uh, you literally will will gain access to uh, billions of records of uh, deceased persons that they've digitized and they've made searchable. And just on that note, by the way, um, I'm going to add this to the chat. FamilySearch.org uh, recently did a, um, a profile on me um, and my my family search journey. So I include I just included a link in the chat. Um, so feel free to uh, check that profile out if you if you uh, if you're interested. Okay, and awesome. And this is a question I actually had too. How were you able to decipher the handwriting on those documents? Because a lot of it was looking real. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> There's no easy answer. Um, what would I say? Number one, when I bought a laptop, my personal laptop, I bought one with the biggest screen that I could find <laughs> because <laughs> you really need to give yourself a chance to see this stuff in big print. Um, it is difficult to, to decipher. That's number one. Number two is, um, uh, there are floating around in uh, on the you know you could Google it, but we're not used to reading cursive anymore, uh, and so you can find like references on um, cursive from the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s that you can use as a reference to to try to decipher exactly what they're writing. So I'd encourage you to do that. And then the third thing I would do is I'd say just um, I actually have a lot of friends and family members who share a passion for genealogy, get your crew of uh, genealogists, you're doing it together. And if you find a document you're having trouble transcribing, like share it with them, ask them what they, you know, do you, can you tell what this word is, right? Um, so you can crowdsource uh, help um, to decipher some of these documents as well, but it's, it's hard work, but th those are some of the tips that I've used to um, to try to start to transcribe. And then what I usually do is when I when I am able to transcribe a document, I put it in Word, and then I um, add it to my family tree, so that if anyone else is interested in that document, they don't have to 
try to decipher it on their own, they could just go to my transcription as a reference. Awesome. And that's actually how I ended up finding Andre. He has a website for the Combo family. And I kept seeing that name come up on my family tree. And he has a whole website and stuff I couldn't read and all this stuff. And I, that's how I was able to find him on Facebook was through that website. So you might be that person in your family that, you know, is compiling all the information and put it online. You never know, you know, who might stumble upon it and the connections you can make that way. Um, so that'll kind of touch in with Sheila's question. Um, I know you mentioned about online, but for the city that might not be digitized, do you recommend going to where your ancestors might have lived to kind of see documents that way? Absolutely. Um, and I've done that. Um, I, I, I mentioned I went to the um, Library of uh, Virginia and I've researched records there. I've been to um, the uh, State Library in North Carolina to research records there. I've been to local libraries and um, for example, Northampton County, North Carolina, which, which is where my uh, Cumbo ancestors were from and I've researched records there. So I would encourage you to do that as well, absolutely. And, and, and when you're there, like again, this is all part of this amazing journey. Like genealogy to me has just enriched my life. I'm living my life, but I'm also in, so not only am I experiencing my own life, but I'm experiencing the life of my ancestors through the, uh, my research journey. And so when you are um, in those towns, you know, find a way to connect with people and, um, you know, distant cousins or people who may know you about your family and set up time with them and connect with them and ask them questions and uh, incorporate that into your research, right? So never miss an opportunity. When you go to a, a town where your ancestors came from, um, don't just restrict yourself to the library. Find ways to go and visit places where they lived or where they went to church or where they lived their lives. Um, find uh, opportunities to connect with people and interview them and learn all that you can uh, from them about your own family. So, um, you know, uh, definitely pursue all those experiences when you are um, visiting the, the towns and locations of your, of your family. Awesome. That's so true. Um, Joyce asks, um, and this is a good question too. My mother was an only child deceased as is both of my grandparents. I keep getting stumped on her side of the family. What recommendations would you give in that situation? Um, I would say on your approach, on the, the, the um, genealogy approach, I, I, I recommended um, that, uh, you know, capture your family tree as you know it. It sounds like you've done that. Um, and then um, uh, talk with family members. It sounds like uh, they were, um, you know, only children. So there's there may be limited information you can get from that. But then you get into traditional genealogical records research. Um, find your grandparents' uh, uh, death records, their um, marriage records. Those are records that. Or, or census records, those are records that can give you clues into who their parents might have been, right? The marriage record may list their parents. Um, the death record may list their parents. They may be listed in a census record uh, in as a child in a household of adults that are, it's reasonable to assume that that's their parents. So start with those documents and see, work your way back from them to see where that, that leads you to uncover more about your, uh, your, your mother's ancestry. Awesome. And Joy wanted to know about the fire, about the 1870 records. I never knew that as far as why that's a kind of a gap there. Yeah. And it, it's not 1870, it's 1890. So 1870 okay. was the first census in which formerly enslaved people appear by name. Previously, okay. uh, our ancestors, if they were enslaved, they would show up as um, either a, a count, number of enslaved persons to an enslaver, or uh, as a an age, a sex, and a color, right? Like uh, persons enslaved to Cater Biggs, a 30-year-old woman mulatto, right? Um, that would have maybe what been one of my ancestors. Um, but yeah, the 1890 census, the entire federal census for 1890 burned in a, in a fire. So I, 
you you uh you definitely come across those ancestors where you're like man if i just could see what their household looked like in 1890 would answer so many questions but unfortunately that's just the challenge that we face so you gotta you gotta find a way to uncover um more information about those ancestors uh through different documents yeah because then it's so crazy because then now you have instead of a 10-year gap now you have a 20-year gap where a whole bunch of life can happen in 20 years that you kind of miss. Mm -hmm. um, Zimble wants to know, what is the best way to locate military records? Mm. So um, I would say familysearch.org has many uh, military records available. And again, that's a free service. Um, Ancestry.com has also has military records. So if you subscribe to Ancestry, for again, it's like a hundred bucks a year, you'll get access to military records. And then um, another paid service called Fold3 um, has um, really in-depth uh, database of, of military records. So just in terms of online resources, Family Search, Ancestry, Fold3 are three, uh, three uh, sources that come to mind for me. Awesome. And then before we leave, guys, we will make sure we put all these links in the chat um, so that way they are accessible um, to you as well. Um, Trakita Overton said, um, has he, have you done BlackAncestry.com as one of the services? I'm not familiar with BlackAncestry.com. I am familiar with African Ancestry. So if you mean African Ancestry, yes, I have tested with African Ancestry. And so that's a test service that uh, where you can test and they do the two of the three DNA test types that I mentioned in my presentation. The, uh, the maternal, the mtDNA, the maternal DNA test, which traces your direct maternal ancestry or the Y DNA test, which traces your direct paternal ancestry. Uh, and they specialize in um, only uh, African ancestry, right? So if your uh, direct paternal ancestors or your direct maternal ancestors came from Europe, then um, they're not going to be able to help you much. But if they, if they trace back to Africa, then uh, you'll get a certificate back and um, they'll let you know where they estimate your direct maternal paternal ancestor came from in Africa. So yeah, I've done that as well. Interestingly enough, I did it and found out that uh, my direct paternal ancestry traces back to Europe and um, my direct maternal ancestry does as well. So I'm a wow. unicorn, I'm a genealogical unicorn. I am a black man with two, with a, a direct maternal European ancestry and direct paternal <laughs> European wow. ancestry. So that's uh, again, part of the adventures and discoveries of this journey. Right, right. Um, Sharon wants to know, are there groups that provide support resources associate, associated with genealogy searches? Absolutely. So um, one thing that comes to mind is the, um, are the, the, uh, our genealogy societies. Um, the, the first one comes to mind is the um, Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, AUGS. A-A-H-G-S. Uh, and so that's a genealogical society that focuses on African-American genealogy. And so that's a society that you can join and um, uh, go to meetings and they have working groups where they help each other advance their, uh, their genealogy. Um, they host events like this, you know, talking about tips and strategies for genealogy and host conferences and those types of things. So AUGS is a great um, organization. And then, um, you know, the other thing is like, there are local genealogical societies, like there's a North, there's like a North Carolina uh, genealogical society, there's a Virginia genealogical society. So maybe you can kind of identify where your family members are from and look for the genealogical societies of those locations. Uh, and uh, they may be able to help as well. And then as, uh, as Taryn mentioned on um, introducing me, uh, I'm a board member for the National Genealogical Society. So that's um, another society that you can consider joining 
and having access to all the resources and tools and conferences and things that we make available to members to help to empower them to advance their ancestry. Um, so there's that. Yeah, and I do believe, and I'll find it and put the link in the chat as well, um, that Georgia has its own um, genealogical society. I didn't see too many people in the beginning for the iceberg, but if you do have roots in Georgia, um, you can kind of sometimes face some of the same things like with me and Andre, our family is in um, North Carolina. It's a high population of Native Americans in Georgia, just like it was in North Carolina. So sometimes those records and all of that is kind of um, convoluted. So those societies and groups can help you kind of decipher those things as well. Um, Yvette, who also says she's about to meet a cousin in, in a few weeks um, that she met online. She's been doing it for three months. She asked, can we access the Freedman records? Yes. So Freedman Bureau records are available for free online. Um, so we need to get the link out. But um, those records are available in familysearch.org for sure. But uh, if you Google kind of Friedman's records, one of the top links results to come back should give you uh, a web page where you can really just start searching in a simple way. And so that's, that's how I was able to find that Friedman's viewer record for my third grade grandmother, um, Sarah Biggs. Okay, awesome. And then this is just a question I have, and then we'll open it up for just some comments and quick um, questions from anybody that would like to say anything to Andre. Um, but is there a, a noticeable difference between the freed and paid services as far as the information that you can get from them online? What I would say is um, there's not a lot of difference. Let's take uh, familysearch.org, which is free, and Ancestry, which is uh Pay, uh, paid service. There's not a whole lot of difference I've noticed in terms of the documents that are available. Um, but the difference is like on Ancestry, it just gives you all one place where you can have your tree, you can, uh, you can take your DNA test, have your DNA results attached to your tree, and then with that, and have access to all the records. And what they do is they, um, they will like serve up hints, right? Like, so they'll get, they, 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 uh, they will give you prompts. So like, take a look at this record. This record may be, uh, you know, relevant for your ancestor, right? So they have basically designed a service to give you, to, to offer clues and hints and just make it easier for you to uncover all the relevant documents for your family. So it's features like that, that you get on a paid service like Ancestry that you wouldn't necessarily get for family search. For family search, you'll just get access to all the records and you just kind of figure it out on your own, right? So that's a little bit of the value add you get with a service like uh, ancestry.com. But I think for the most part, the the access to the the records is is very similar across both. Okay, awesome. So if anybody has any questions or comments for Andre, if you could just raise your hand, use the reaction, raise your hand button, and we'll try to get in as many um, that we can in the last 10 minutes of the presentation. And then I'm also putting the links to um, some of the resources that he mentioned as well in the chat um, for those that are interested. And then Andre, what was the one that you said? Um, I just remember it had a three at, at the end of it. Uh fold fold three okay fold three okay and we have a question how does one become a genealogist uh to commit yourself to uncovering your family history and start doing it and at a certain point you can just say hey i'm a genealogist i've traced my family tree um so really i think it is as simple as that is to commit yourself to uncovering your family history um, of course, there are uh, different certifications and things that you can achieve to uh, represent a level of uh, uh, proficiency and advancement in your, um, you know, research abilities. Uh, so you can pursue those. But I think just uh, working on your own to uncover your family history, uh, once you've applied the approach that uh, that I outlined in this presentation, I think you can, you know, comfortably call yourself a genealogist. 
Awesome. Awesome. So we got so many. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you in the chat. Um, I'm just trying to catch up here, guys, and put some of the stuff in the chat because I am going to save the chat and we'll also um, send that out with the recording um, on Monday. Um, so be on the lookout with that with your email. And we just want to say thank you so much for joining us, spending this um, beautiful Saturday morning with us. I'm glad you all enjoyed and got a lot of knowledge from this. Hopefully we'll be able to bring Andre back and maybe we'll have like a 102 class once we see how far <laughs> how far people have gotten um you know with their searches because I do know just with me personally the the searching part is fun but then sometimes you kind of get stuck on those branches and it's just like oh my gosh can somebody else look at this for me uh, maybe that could be something that I can explore with the city of South Fulton residents if you guys want to kind of have your own um kind of group so I'm going to put my email um in the chat so if you guys have any further ideas that you want to kind of see this um, go. Like I said, this was our first time doing this. Um, so you will get a survey when this meeting ends. So if you could please do me a favor and take that survey, let us know how this event um, was, how what we can do to improve it if you want to see it again. So um, we just wish you all well in your discovery. Uh, did you have any last words, Andre, for everybody? No, thanks for this opportunity. Thank you again. And uh... Happy Black History Month, everybody. Yes, happy Black History Month. Okay, everyone. So thank you so much. Um, again, I'm going to save the chat as well as the recording, and you all will get it on Monday. And we um, hope you have a great and blessed uh, weekend. So thank you, guys. <laughs>